Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of Critical Reef Theory by CRT. In episode one, I'd like to talk about a revolutionary brew right here. <laughs> but before we do that, I'd like to give some personal background about myself. My name is Alan Vo, and I go by Coral Reef Tank on Reef to Reef. And you can find me on Instagram as uh, CRT underscore reefs. Uh, and yeah, I've been reefing ever since I was a wee lad right here. Uh, I got into reef keeping uh, quite young, and I've always been fascinated about the amount of life you could keep in a glass box in your house. And uh, I'm glad to say that reef keeping has really allowed me to go uh, pretty far in my short life so far. It allowed me to attend one of the best universities in the U.S. Uh, and ultimately, I ended up writing my thesis uh, regarding the reefing industry as well. Uh, I'm an operations research and financial engineer uh, major at Princeton. And while I was there, I also had an interest in theoretical ecology as well. And I will say this part is probably the most important uh, aspect to this series. Uh, without taking this class at school, I don't think I would have been able to apply, um, you know, these mathematical concepts into a living, thriving ecosystem. It's quite hard to imagine that you can turn math and apply it and turn it into life. It's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, in this episode, I'd like to talk about the impetus to my idea, theory behind it, and the culmination in my concoction as well. Um, I was recently featured in uh, Beyond the Reef podcast with Adam Sutherland and that was a great experience. And in that podcast, you can find uh, some like pre preliminary talks about my concoction as well. And before we really dive into this, I'd like to give uh, you know credit where it's due. Um, a lot of the products I use do uh, originate from the Zubit uh, KZ line, um, aquaphorus. Um, a lot of commercial foods are available out there. It's not so much a brand new product, but more so a new method to optimize the use of what you have. And uh, <clears throat> the impetus behind this was seeing how Sunny X's uh, like reef was so productive in such a short amount of time. And Sunny's a big proponent in little bacteria, and he's a big bacteria-driven uh, reef uh, guy. And I really took a lot of inspiration from his approach. And with that, I thought, you know, I think there could be some improvements here and there, more so in terms of nutrition. And uh, with a little bit of my personal touch, here we go. So <clears throat> right after school, I had a good amount of free time. So I spent the summer doing a lot of research on the topic of coral nutrition, uh, coral microbiome, yes, coral reproductive cycles, a lot of things on how the coral actually functions as an organism. Uh, I found that quite interesting to find that, you know, corals as we know it aren't just one, you know, unit. They are a huge colony of individual corals that form this huge meta-organism. And even there, if we dive down even further, we can break down the coral microbiome. And when we look at that, we see there are a ton of microbes fungi, bacteria, protozoa that live on the coral itself, and they each have their own role in how the coral functions. And uh, so that really, you know, sprung my curiosity, and I really wanted to see how I could apply, you know, this newfound knowledge in my reef system. And I've always personally been really interested in uh, coral nutrition, um, it seems like there are like a plethora of products out there and they all kind of say whatever the hell, you know, they want to do. Is it true? I don't know. But, you know, I do obviously see better results with certain products compared to others. And maybe it's because they use better ingredients, but I'm not exactly sure. So what I wanted to accomplish with my summer of research was to improve uh, growth and coloration of the corals themselves be able to feed a diverse range of corals and to minimize the waste and to maximize the efficiency of my products. 
So uh, as we dive in, I wanted to examine some existing methods just for inspiration. And what it really boils down is you have to understand the fundamentals of reef keeping, what water changes do and don't do, uh, the maintenance of elemental parameters uh, like calcium, magnesium, strontium, fluoride, a lot of individual tiny, tiny minute things that you really wouldn't think about otherwise, but maintaining them in the right parameters is quite key in achieving optimal coral color in my belief. And not just coral color, the biology as well within a reef system. Um, a lot of these processes require these minute trace elements to actually occur. And without you know proper levels of them, the biology can get screwed up. Certain processes won't happen. And that's why a lot of people will see issues until they correct their uh, parameters. Um, the flow within the aquarium, you know, how much flow the corals are getting. If they don't get enough, that's an issue. Getting too much, also an issue. Uh, lighting, um, you know, are your corals getting adequate light? Are the right corals getting the right amount of light? You know, yada, yada. We can go on for lighting in like another episode. But what I really wanted to focus on was looking at uh, previous uh, approaches to nutrition and elemental parameters. So one of like the original methods out there is the Ballin method. Uh, it maintains, you know, major elements such as um, calcium and alkalinity. And some products out there include some trace elements in there as well. But it doesn't really account for magnesium. And it also doesn't account for uh, the majority of like the stable uh, upkeep of trace elements. Uh, no magnesium, no trace elements, and doesn't really focus on the nutritional needs of the coral as well. And, you know, for this method, you know, as you can see here, Tropic Marins, um, it's quite simple. It only comes in three parts. It's a simple, easy to follow regimen. You read the instructions, you calculate what you need for your system, boom, you got it. Easy. But I would say this would get you roughly maybe 70% if you're really trying to go for um, one product for all your needs. This is not going to, you know, give you all your needs at a super densely populated reef system. You're going to need to supplement this somehow. Um, next, I kind of think of this as an evolution of the barn method. It's like Reef Moonshine, Triton. Um, what they do is they pr uh, provide a comprehensive maintenance of your major and trace elements because you dose these elements individually. And so you have precise control of how much goes into your system. And uh, you can understand the depletion and, and calculate it for your own individual needs. Um, what this does, um, uh, an issue with this, I think, is that it does not directly approach uh, nutritional needs or it doesn't exactly supply all the nutritional needs for the coral. It does it indirectly by providing the proper biology, by keeping all the trace elements in check. And ideally, given that your system is populated with the correct bacteria and has the proper microbiome, the proper biology will take place. And therefore, you'll see the great results by keeping all your uh, uh, elements within a good range or whatever. So it's quite detailed. There's a lot of emphasis on data. Um, it's reliant on quarterly or monthly ICP testing to ensure that you have your, your target parameters because a lot of these parameters you can't test for, the trace elements uh, specifically, you can just kind of approximate by how much you're dosing. And you won't really know unless you calculate your rate of consumption. And there's one issue um, some people might find with these methods. It, are they're quite tedious. They require a lot of, you know, some daily maintenance. Not a lot, but it is, you know, more than some people might want to do. But to each their own goals. Um, you do what you want with your own reef system. It's up to you. And another approach right here are the KZ and aquaforest methods. Um, these methods are really big proponents of bacteria using and uh, just probiotic dosage of bacteria and maintenance. So it's a probiotic reef keeping method. Um, the philosophies for these methods, in my opinion, are quite dated. That's because Zeovit really pushed for a pastel 
the most bleached Acropora look. And I feel like the trend in the hobby has shifted away from that really pale, thin looking pastel coloration. And people really want that rich, vibrant color. In a lot of issues, people had writing on the Zeovid systems that you were really on a razor's edge. Um, issues could crop up because you were keeping your reef at such an extreme level of like water clarity being stripped down and uh, adding specific uh, elements to limit the zoosant belly of the coral. You were really curating color based off the system and not what the actual coral exhibits. So that could lead to, you know, unexpected RTN in some cases. Um, what I liked about these, um, uh, these systems is that there was a heavy emphasis on coral nutrition and nutrient export. You can see here, a ton of these products are made for, what well, these are bacteria, uh, flatworm stops a trace element, coral vitalizers, coral vitalizers of food, coral snow is calcium carbonate of flocculin, coals extra, uh, trace elements, K-balance trace, trace amino acids you can see amount the amount of stuff that goes into the kz system and what it really wanted you to do was run such an extreme nutrient export and then supplement with all these uh products well i mean obviously that works because you're stripping everything and forced to add it back in of course it's going to work uh, and don't get me wrong each of these products have their own use cases on their own and can be used with or you know outside of the KZ system with a little extra ingenuity and thought behind it. But you know, for my purposes, not the best because you know it, it gets it gets expensive, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. This this picture is money right here. This is the money shot. If I had this cabinet, yeah, that'd be nice. I'd know it'd be rich. <laughs> All right. But yeah. An issue, another issue I had with these um, products specifically is such vague, vague, vague wording like secondary biological factor, cleaning substrate, reduction of mold. What does that exactly mean? Like microorganisms, healthy, well, bacterial fauna. It's like, you know, quite vague. You don't really understand what the use cases are for these products. And you can, you know, new reefers or inexperienced people. Uh, within the ecosystem, you just won't know what to use it for. And, you know, with my probably decade plus using these specific KZ products, uh, this isn't my picture, by the way, but using some of these KZ products like Zeobac, Flatworm Stop, Coral Vitalizer, Pulse Extra, uh, Coral Booster. From my experience, I kind of know what to expect while using them because I've done ICP tests. I can kind of see what elements go up when I dose them and when I don't dose them. But if someone's new and has never done this before, they wouldn't know that, you know, flatworm stop raises your iodine and has a bunch of trace elements. Same with coral booster. You would know that you would just go off of whatever's on the bottle and you would assume that, oh, it's a good product. It's going to make my coral stronger, right? So I'm going to put in a little extra, little extra, little extra. And then eventually you're just going to realize that that little extra you did, you know, one week ago was way too much. And you've been doing that for two weeks now and stuff is not looking good. And you're just going to crash your system if you don't do it correctly and you don't have, you know, that sixth sense developed yet. So one thing I set out to was kind of research and try and define or parse through this vague language and try and reverse engineer these products, or at least use them in a more efficient manner where I can get more bang for my buck versus like, you know, this is a 10 milliliter bottle. That's not a lot. So imagine you have a, several hundred gallons or a thousand gallons or water or whatever. You're just going to burn through it. And the price is, you know, it adds up. <clears throat> So some of the takeaways and the emphasis that I wanted to put on from uh, these other systems here, KZ, uh, Moonshine, Triton, Ballin Method, other you know general stuff like there, is that there is a key emphasis on maintaining elemental stability and proper nutrition. Um, keeping all these 
macro micro elements and your nutrient stable leveraging biology you know like with the kz system and the probiotics you're using a lot of bacteria to dissolve and digest all the excess in your system and then that bacteria can go and feed your corals that sounds amazing <clears throat> you know all of them also advocate for adequate lighting flow um <clears throat> You really have to understand the needs of your specific coral. What are you growing? What are you considering? Are you growing LPS primarily, SPS, NPS, softies, mixed, or you know whatever? You have to understand that each coral or each specific general type of coral needs different requirements. And none of these things, a lot of these things, might be sound, might be found, you know. <clears throat> in completely different micro ecosystems within this big ecosystem, you know, the reef, but these corals can be found meters and meters apart at different depths, different amounts of flow, uh, contact them. They obviously get different amounts of uh, resources wherever they are in the reefs. So we have to take that into consideration when we <clears throat> plan out what our reefs are gonna be. We also have to provide proper nutrition as well, and not just the maintenance of nutrients in these common sense, such as nitrates and phosphates. We have to maintain particulate and microorganisms in the water column. That's what the corals really feed on. They don't feed on the nitrogen compounds or they're not as efficient. You know, <clears throat> imagine if you were to take just a bunch of, let's say, vitamin supplements versus eating an entire meal, carrots, steak, eggs, you know, a full well-rounded meal, food pyramid and everything. What's to say, you know, that vitamin, sure, it might contain all the things that a human needs, but the amount of nutrition derived from that vitamin versus that full meal, it's completely different. Um, <clears throat> I also noticed that um, there was an advocation for broadcast feeding or spot feeding. Um, they have a lot of products in there addressed to that. <clears throat> Obviously, you also have to feed your fish and inhabitants as well. So <clears throat> another one, uh, uh, another parallel I wanted to draw was how reef keeping should really be approached as ecosystem keeping. And you can kind of see how these Venn diagrams kind of overlap where <clears throat> in classical classical ecosystem management, we have to deal with ecological issues, socioeconomic issues, and institutional issues right here. And we can kind of transpose these ideas over and realize that <clears throat> we can apply this to our own reef systems right here. And that all culminates in this centerpiece right here, which is your reef. <clears throat> Man, I'm sorry for my voice. It sounds nutty. All right, so <clears throat> this next leads me into my next kind of uh, general idea slash topic and how you should approach reef keeping so that you should derive an optimal strategy. You want to maximize your expected payoff, right? Whatever you're doing, you want to get the most out of it. And, you know, logically, <clears throat> being like a rational agent, you want to find an optimal strategy so that <clears throat> all your needs and considerations are met. You want to consider your personal goals, needs of your organisms. Is it easy to use? The fundamental ideology and philosophy behind it. And at the end of the day, what it really boils down to is the cost. You know, is it worth it for me to do it? Because like, you know, this stuff is expensive. Reefing isn't cheap. One thing you can consider is that an optimal strategy can be considered a holistic solution. And the term holistic is kind of seen as like, this holy grail, because what does the word holistic really mean? It means that you have fundamentally analyzed the whole system and have chosen the best path for yourself to get the best payoff. A holistic solution <clears throat> takes into consideration the entire picture. And what we've done here is created the entire picture. Once we realize what the entire picture is, we can focus on what part of the picture we really like the most? And that part of the picture translates to our optimal strategy here. Same thing. 
with how that is your read, right? That's your favorite, right? You created it. It's your masterpiece. And also, I really want to advocate for approaching your issues holistically and finding holistic solutions. A lot of people right now are looking for Band-Aid solutions. They're temporary. They're not going to solve your stuff in the long run. And that's 100% true. If you <clears throat> do not stem or cut the issue at its stem, it's just going to crop up again. And if, let's say, you have a, a fundamental nutrient export issue that you're not addressing, that's going to crop up again. That's going to lead to algae blooms or cyano or whatever your issue might be. If you don't nip it at the bud, it's coming back. So what I wanted really people to understand and take away is that it's best to combine philosophies and different approaches so that we can create a balanced approach to reef keeping. That's why when people say, you know, X light is the best or X reefing method is the best, it's the best for them. But you also have to take into consideration that that one method may not meet all your needs. That's why a lot of people run calcium reactors and then they add two part and then they add calc. And then with all that in mind, they decide to do Triton or Moonshine, you know, just to meet that tiny little extra bit that they weren't already getting from their previous solution. It's about creating a balanced solution, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, make it all together, work out the cons and maximize the pros. That's how we should approach this. <clears throat> and now a lot of these methods ultimately provide a comprehensive solution primarily for abiotic factors. So we have it all, you know, pretty relatively cut out for us in regards to <clears throat> parameters and lighting, all that stuff flow. We really don't have to take too much concern for that. But what I really want to dive into is the nutrition. All right. Like I said, parameters are taken care of. Triton, moonshine, easy, lighting, LEDs, T5, metal halides, all work. And then your inhabitants, you know, whatever you decide to keep, grow, you have to worry about them. You have to keep them alive, right? <clears throat> and that's where I believe nutrition is kind of overlooked. There's so many products out there. And without really diving in to understanding how corals derive their nutrition to begin with, you don't know where to start. So let's look at a very simplistic general model. <clears throat> There's multiple pathways for corals. Um, they can divide, derive a lot of it from photosynthesis and the utilization of the zooxanthellae uh, that are endosymbionts with the corals. So you can kind of see here, you know, the cycle of how the corals acquire the zooxanthellae and how they work. The zooxanthellae produce sugars um, <clears throat> uh, through photosynthesis and the corals kind of siphon it off from the zooxanthellae. Some research, research says that they can get roughly maybe 80% at most, but that does leave a wide gap of energy that we can be also providing in addition to the corals. And, you know, obviously this coral polyp can rely on its endosymbionts, but it's able to survive on its own too. And in studies, it's shown that feeding corals versus light alone versus a combination, they found that corals in the dark with no light, but with a constant supply of food and particulate matter survive versus the extra sterile system with only light. So that's just some food for thought. All right, and this goes more into the talking about uh, the endosymbionts uh, that exist within the coral whether it be the zooxanthellae, bacteria, or any other thing that live alongside the coral organism. Corals can actually ingest them in times of need. Um, 
So what the coral really does is that it forms the bacteria. If you ever pull out a healthy acro, it has a distinct smell. And you've also noticed that they have a lot of mucus. They're very slimy. They, they'll drip. <clears throat> and if you put them back into the system, they'll be slimy for a few hours, maybe in a few days. And you really don't notice that from an unhealthy coral, right? So put a little thought into that. And we come to see that <clears throat> the amount of mucus that is produced is kind of correlated with the health of the coral in general. So that extra mucus allows for extra farming land, extra farming land to grow all your crops on. You know, more crops, more crops here. That means you have enough food for, you know, when a drought comes. So more mucus, healthier corals. So the corals can pretty much save these up and use them on during times of need, just like a piggy bank. Corals can also capture a lot of their energy and nutritional requirements through prey capture uh, to catch stuff in the open water column. You know, the coral is designed for this. You know, corals are bacteriovores. They're filter feeders. Water pushes through them. And microorganisms, large particulates or whatever, are, you know, grabbed out of the water. That's what a coral is. It's a huge filter, a living filter, pretty much. And here, you can see some of the results that I can achieve. This is pretty much observed on a lot of speciosa types, tenuous as well. After feeding, they pretty much all spew out their mesenterial filaments on demand, and they're catching a ton of stuff. And you can kind of see right here, this lumpy area I had fed prior to this picture as well. So once the mesenterial filaments pull back in, they kind of create like these little lumpy areas, which I believe are just like mesenterial filaments filled with the foods and particulates being retracted back under, underneath the tissue so that the coral can digest it. So this kind of leads into the question of what's the best way to feed? Um, don't commercial foods already fit the need? Well, a lot of them do exist right now. I wouldn't say everything's on an equal playing ground, you know? Some are obviously better for others. Some are designed for different purposes. Some will skyrocket certain nutrients out of whack. All You have to all take this all into consideration on what your system needs and how you want to address your issues, right? So there are uh, refined particulate foods. You can see here some liquid foods that are commonly available and like certain live feeds that you can use to feed your corals. Historically, the concept of feeding leads to pollution, right? This is like pretty traditional thought, right? If you leave some food outside, after a while, it's gonna start spoiling, right? That food essentially turned into a pollutant. But those issues really stem from a poor utilization of resources. Food is energy, you know, that food, if you eat it, it turns into energy for your body. So uneaten food is waste. That means there's a lack of bioavailability if it's not digested and consumed. And certain corals are inadequately stimulated because of this. Just because you have a fridge full of food doesn't mean you really wanna eat what's inside that fridge, right? If you have a bag of carrots, potatoes, some beef, you really don't want to just eat one of those ingredients. You really want to turn that stuff into a meal, right? And we're going to build on that, you know, idea, that concept, that roadmap later on. <clears throat> Overfeeding kind of leads to issues with poor quality as well, uh, water quality as well. If you just add in a little bit extra food, that that extra matter, it rapidly decays. And if it's not properly process, you know, it just turns into a fouling agent, um, which can also lead to like more pests like algae, uh, aptasia, stuff like that. And feeding more is kind of counterproductive in some cases. In some cases, 
some cases it leads to more mortality and just feeding more is just logistically taxing. Um, it's going to cost more. It's going to take more time, stuff like that. So some caveats, I'll say that a lot of them, you know, they're good products, but the thing is they have to be properly administered. You can't just dump something into your tank after you read the description on it and think that it's going to work the way exactly that it says on the product. It might if it's, you know, well vetted. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people have experience with it, but at the end of the day, it's going to get costly. It's going to get expensive. It's uh, comprised of like dead matter. Um, a lot of the dead matter is just going to decay even further, right? And a lot of the products are so concentrated that overdose or um, excess is quite easily uh, achieved. So my idea or my goal was to minimize these fouling issues and increasing the amount of product if possible. You know, that sounds like a pipe dream, you know, how can I use less and get more? That's the million dollar question, right? But <clears throat> what I did was I started looking at nature and starting to realize what is a coral reef and how it actually functions and applying that into a closed environment, into our aquarium. So we know that, you know, the actual reef water, it's not super clear. No one's running a 100 micron filter sock through it 24 seven. What I believe is commonly occurring in a lot of reef systems is that we're over filtrating our water. Just look at the amount of stuff in here. That's like a drop of like seawater, pods, whatever the heck these things are, you know, filled with stuff. Corals are constantly feasting. So just imagine that one drop of water goes through this acropora colony. It's catching something, you know, one of these things is getting gobbled up. I don't know what, but it is, it will. It's just, you know, probability. It's a matter of time. So what I kind of found out is uh, the concept of marine snow. What marine snow, I like to dub it as living dead food. So what is it? It's what feeds the reef, right? This marine snow falls through from the surface. Everything accumulates at the bottom and the top upwellings bring it all back up and then the corals eventually feed on it again. So what is it? Bacteria, decaying matter, zoo phytoplankton, zoo or phyto, you know, and, you know, and a bunch of inorganic materials as well, carbonates, stuff like that. It's a nutrient rich feed and it's critical in the ocean's nutrient cycling. So I also got inspiration from one of the most famous naturalists, uh, Charles Darwin, and his uh, famous paradox or uh, the concept of it. So you, you can read here, how are these super productive, diverse ecosystems existing in areas of low nutrients? Um, <clears throat> area, these areas are highly competitive and every niche is taken up. There's something doing every role possible out there. Every job is taken, every job opportunity is taken. You know, like I said, everything exists for some purpose out there. And it's constantly cycled from <clears throat> living matter to dead matter, living matter to dead matter. The cycle just keeps on continuing and continuing, keeps on going and going and going. And here's a nice diagram of what I was uh, talking about. So <clears throat> right here, your increased nutrients. This is where the marine snow starts forming, right? It's still living. And <clears throat> it starts sinking, sinking, sinking. And then the currents sweep it back up, sweep it back up. And then they go in here. They go in here. Things are slowly filtered out. They go back down. Things start increasing. They start swirling. They can come back up. That's the general principle. And this entire time, it's not ever 100% dead. Issues right now with like excess human fertilizer and stuff, that's because all that stuff is inorganic, dead waste material. And that's causing all the issues, like that super bad water disease and stuff like that. 
But if it's maintained um, <clears throat> as living biomass, you really don't have those issues with decay. Just think about, um, just think about yourself. You know, as you walk around day to day, you aren't super smelly, or you know, I don't know, maybe depending on the person, but you don't stink. But imagine if you were to pass away and your body was just left there, you would you would reek within a day. So similar concepts apply here. If we keep it all as a living biomass, <clears throat> we have less issues in regarding to fouling properties, uh, odors, uh, rotting issues, uh, disease, stuff like that. <clears throat> so what can we achieve? Or how do we achieve this? Like I said earlier, with the fridge, we start cooking, right? We pull stuff from the fridge and then we create something at the end right that's what we got to do for our reefs as well we got to open our minds to cooking for our reefs so obviously you know the ingredients alone don't taste like the cake if you were just to eat eggs or just sugar some butter some vanilla or some flour obviously if you put all that in your mouth it doesn't taste like this it's gonna taste pretty nasty or maybe it's your thing kudos but <clears throat> What I want to postulate is that in the ocean, the majority, the nutrients are bound in living organisms, like these examples. And a lot of reefers use dead foods, and we have to turn them alive. We have to turn them alive somehow. And then how do we convert this? We got to start thinking how to minimize the pollutive effect, minimize free nutrients in the water column. What can we really cultivate that's, you know, pretty accessible for everyone, pretty cheap in the long run, and kind of proven to show benefits through, you know, years and years in the hobby? We got to leverage some bacteria. We got to let things linger too. But I want to talk about all the pros about bacteria. Bacteria rapidly replicate. So they multiply super fast. They assimilate nutrients and waste from the water column. They minimize the waste, like I said. <clears throat> they exist in nutrient transfer and energy transfer, like I said, with the cycles. The bacteria are at the base of it. And they just keep on permeating throughout, throughout, throughout. Pretty ex inexpensive as well. And they're readily accessible for corals. Corals are bacteria vores. They strip bacteria from the water column, use them. They farm them, they eat them. I think the key or what the early systems like KZ really thought or saw was how efficient corals utilize bacteria. So like I said, bacteria are at the bottom of the food chain essentially. And it's only up from there, baby. <clears throat> so the bacteria are producers. We can think of them as producing energy from waste products, from light uh, in some cases. And by increasing the amount of producers, we increase the amount of energy at higher trophic levels. So you can see here, this is a, a general concept. They say that roughly 10% of energy is moved between energy or trophic levels. So let's say we have 100 units of our producers right here, our bacteria, algae, phytoplankton. <clears throat> that means at the next level, we're going to have about 10 units of whatever consumes these guys, these guys down here. There's a 10% decrease at each level. And so that means we only have enough energy for this one hypothetical coral unit. But let's say we were to increase it. If we have 1,000 here, this means we have 100. And at the end, we have 10. <clears throat> and like I said before, since bacteria are so rapidly replicating, so easily accessible, I think that's the best method compared to algae and phytoplankton. So as a result, we're going to increase our yield with minimal pollution and waste. That's because we're using living organisms to bind up all the nutrients and all the goodies, and we're turning it into a biomass. 
that eventually the corals feast on. Now that's quite yummy. And you can really see here what I can achieve in terms of polyp extension and just like the quality of the polyps. What you really notice is after a while of feeding or sustained feeding, the characteristics of the polyps become different as well. Uh, they develop these, you know, longer filaments capable of catching more particulates. If you see a, a coral that's kind of underfed, the polyps are relatively stubby. They don't really protrude very far from the coralite. But here you can see the amount of polyp extension, and not just that, the characteristics of the polyps as well. Super flowy, the ideal look for you know any SPS keeper. Same here. Super flowy has that accentuated one uh, sweeper tentacle, I guess. But yeah. The corals are designed for stripping bacteria out of the water column, and they do a great job at it. And you really notice once you start this routine. This is the concoction, essentially. Um, there's a particulate feed, like I mentioned, uh, more uh, trace elements, uh, carbon source, another amino acids. Acroglow, I believe, are some other nutrients, pulls extra, some other uh, micronutrients, the bacteria, zeobac, probio S, uh, the rebiotic, more particular food, and the enzymes. Um, what you want to do is mix up all these ingredients into one container and let them mingle. What I mean by that is we're going to add some water to that and an air stone, get that stuff bubbling, and let it sit for a while. You know, initially, the water will be relatively see-through and clear, but that's because the bacteria haven't, uh, you know, waken up from their dormant uh, stage yet. But once they do, we'll notice a few uh, changes into the mix. And after you do a little bit of cooking, you know, this is kind of what you get. Here, I've taken out the, the pump, and you can kind of see what is essentially marine snow made in your own home, right? There's bacteria, uh, microorganisms, inorganic materials, trace elements, carbonates, stuff like that. Everything's in there. And the corals gobble this up. The minute I'd say you get like a roughly, on some corals or the speciosis specifically, I'd say within five minutes, mesenterial filaments are out, tenuous as well. It's ridiculous how fast uh, the corals will begin to react. You'll notice your LPS too, they'll start excreting more often, more frequently, like a black goop that just comes out of their mouth. And you know what that is? It's all this. It's all this invisible bacteria that exists or are going to exist in the water column. The corals actively filter that out and they gobble it up and they got to excrete it. The growth is nuts. Tissue is nice and plump too. But yeah, the key is to keep this thing oxygenated. You don't want it to settle or settle for too long because what that will do is pretty much just press all the bacteria down here. No oxygen will enter and it turns into an anoxic zone stuff starts to decay, uh, weird gases form. It kind of turns into a poison at that point, and you don't want that. So that's why it's key to keep it in circulation, constantly moving. This also maximizes the bacteria because you know they have more surface area to adhere in uh, process. You know, Let's say if all this stuff cycled uh, or settled, they would only have the surface here and whatever is floating in the, in the water up here. But if it's constantly agitated, there's a ton of surface area in here. So. so now let's talk what exactly the CRT concoction is. Uh, as you can see here, it kind of just looks like a brown soup. But uh, I'll break down the core composition of what it is here. Um, so the concoction is a blend of probiotics, uh, carbon source, particulate foods, 
enzymes, flocculants, and trace elements alongside fresh salt water. And uh, I'll break down why these are the key components in one second. But as you can see here, I've used a ton of different uh, ingredients and different combinations to create this concoction. Um, I've gone through several iterations and they all seem to provide roughly similar effects. Um, so it really just shows how flexible this method is and not only um, proves some of the concepts, but just shows you how readily accessible any uh, hobbyist can really start doing this. Uh, I'm sure uh, most, you know, really uh, crazy reef junkies out there have some form or one of these products in each of these categories readily accessible to them. Um, so that's really why um, I had this moment. I really wanted to use pretty much all of my products in the most efficient manner. And, you know, over the years, you just accumulate things that you don't completely finish or you just kind of have a little bit left of and you don't know if you can pour it in your tank or not. But uh, I figured, you know, if I let the bacteria get at it first and let them decompose it and assimilate whatever nutrients and compounds into their own bacterial mass, and if I already assume that the corals readily eat bacteria, why not just feed the bacteria and pretty much reuse this food source that potentially could be expired? Because, you know, bacteria are pretty indiscriminate. Um, they will pretty much decompose anything, just given enough time. Um, and as you can see here, this complete uh, looks completely different than pretty much any other mixture uh, or food combination out there on the market, or just like feeding methodology out there. Um, so yeah, so over time, I just kept on experimenting and mixing certain things together. And I started noticing certain effects and I started examining the concoction more, uh, letting it sit out for longer, uh, trying different techniques on it. And I will note that um, the concoction does need constant aeration. Uh, using like an air pump with some airline tubing is probably sufficient. The thing is you, do, you really don't want this sedimentation to occur. Um, you you want to keep everything in the water column and everything in suspension at all times. So let's break down the composition. Uh, the probiotics, uh, this is the long extensive list that I've used. I'm sure a lot of the, uh, the touted uh, marine or reef bacterias out there, like the commercially available ones, can kind of also serve in this uh, use case. Essentially, what we're creating is like an external stomach right here. And we pretty much put in whatever foods uh, that we want into the concoction and we let it digest in here for like a day, a day or two. Um, let that be converted into a bacterial biomass and, and then feed that bacterial biomass to the corals, which readily gobble it up compared to, you know, uh, spot feeding or broadcast feeding a product like Refroids. You know, I've tried it tons of times on SPS specifically. It works on LPS, but the SPS seems to pretty much ignore it. Whereas uh, you can see earlier, once you pour this in, um, the mesenterial filaments instantly come out on several species of corals. And then within, I'd say, a month's time of regular usage, uh, people have reported that uh, pretty much drastically increased growth on a lot of their SPS corals and even dormant SPS corals that have not grown within years begin to start showing new growth. And I've also noticed this anecdotally as well. So yeah, so this really relies on the probiotics. Like the probiotics are the backbone behind this concoction. And I've used Zeobac, ProBioS, Rebiotic, Microbacter 7. Um, those seem to give me good results. One Anecdotally, I have tried um, some of the Dr. Tim's products and they did not give me as good, perhaps maybe even negative results. I experienced some random RTN when I included the Dr. Tim's Eco Balance in the mixture. So just a fair warning. I'm not sure if it was um, 
due to my error or something at that moment in time. But I did notice certain SPS um, looked a little bit less happy when I incorporated the Dr. Tim's product in there. Um, so the carbon source is a direct uh, resource for the probiotics. Without a carbon source, you pretty much won't see a change within the reaction. Um, you won't be able to see the bacterial form biofilms and their biomass just won't be as large if you were to include a carbon source. Um, this is because, you know, the bacteria readily use this to multiply and replicate. And since bacteria pretty much grow at an exponential rate, um, they'll be depleting the carbon source that is available quite fast. And if you don't use it or don't replenish the carbon source over time, you're just going to pretty much limit the lifespan of your concoction. Uh, so the next key ingredient are particulate foods, uh, reef roids, benefits, oyster feast, and as you know, uh, I've used pretty much whatever I had on hand, pellet foods, work, flake. What we really want here is we're essentially, like I said before, we're creating food for the bacteria to consume, right? And all the nutrients within whatever food product you choose to incorporate in here is ultimately going to be broken down at the end of the day and then turn into bacteria. The bacteria will assimilate that, uh, those nutrients and then transfer whatever they have had assimilated through their growth medium to the corals. Um, and then nextly, uh, we have enzymes, this kind of category, flocculants and trace elements. Um, when I talk about enzymes, uh, the commercially available product is Zeozyme. I'm currently doing some more experiments and trying to derive in what Zeozyme actually is. I have a good hunch, but I'm not exactly sure if it is it yet. Um, I do have some uh, hypotheses. And if it is, you know, true, it will pretty much be a breakthrough similar to like using calcium carbonate. The savings will be roughly the same. Zeozyme is quite expensive. And uh, ever since I mentioned it on the Beyond the Reef podcast, I can't seem to get my hands on it anymore. So I've been looking for alternatives. Um, in terms of flocculants, car calcium carbonate's a great flocculant. Um, it's used in uh, shrimp aquaculture as well to raise the pH of their shrimp ponds. And the association with uh, calcium carbonate pH and aquaculture is that uh, pathogenic bacteria are more likely to flourish at lower pH levels. And with shrimp aquaculture, there's, they, they face situations where the shrimp are so packed together, um, it just really exponentiates any chance of uh, disease transfer. And since there are so many shrimp in such a small area, this re readily re uh, lowers the oxygen levels, and that causes... Uh, Massive oxygen depletion makes the shrimp stressed out and more prone to disease. And like we said, with low pH, more pathogenic bacteria, more stressed out shrimp, more disease, that means dead shrimp. And historically, that's why calcium carbonate lime uh, is used in these situations. And that's exactly why I incorporated it in here as well. Um, calcium carbonate has also been found to uh, reduce pathogenic bacteria load while promoting more of the probiotic bacteria. So that's why I incorporated it. Also, um, due to the bacteria and the cellular respiration uh, that occurs in the container, um, you're going to get pH drop naturally. So uh, the Calcium carbonate also serves as a pH buffer in this case to keep the pH within, you know, a, a safe realm and make sure that you don't possibly uh, allow any contamination to flourish. And then trace elements, uh, there are some products. Uh, I like the product by uh, Von Marin. It's called Organic. Um, NP Back to Balance is also pretty good in this use case because uh, NP back to balance is uh, poised as uh, nutrient supplementation plus uh, specific trace elements that bacteria readily consume. So I figured that was a good inclusion as well. And freshly made salt water is another key proponent or component. Uh, that's because um, freshly made salt water limits your possibility of contamination. 
um, if you were to say, take water from your existing aquarium and use it to start your concoction, um, there could be some pathogens that exist in your system without you knowing. And in the meantime, when you're creating this concoction, most of the probiotics that you introduce are in a spore-related state. Um, so they're dormant. So let's say you use actively pathogenic water from your system, put it into the concoction. The pathogens are going to have a head start in here and could potentially outcompete the probiotic bacteria before they have a chance to populate. Um, I think over time, uh, this isn't proven, but just in terms of population dynamics and uh, dynamic equilibriums, um, the potential introduction of a pathogen into the concoction is quite low um, since a lot of these probiotics are actively compete against each other, introducing a, a small population of, let's say, path, uh, some pathogen into here is relatively low in terms of that pathogen out competing um, your pre-established culture. And that's why I also recommend uh, just in terms of like biosecurity and safety that you restart this culture every, you know, few weeks, week or two, uh, just to be safe in terms of not creating, you know, a pest issue or proliferating pathogens. Like I said, it's the probability is quite low unless that pathogen is extremely competitive and can pretty much outcompete whatever probiotic strains exist in your culture already. But just to be safe, uh, I recommend you know consuming all of this concoction, um, letting the culture only go for so long, and then restarting the culture. That way, you can ensure reproducible results and minimize your risk of contamination as well. So here are some uh, guiding principles that uh, I think are important to follow and some key traits while employing this method. Um, you should definitely have a lot of time and patience. Uh, this method, you know, theoretically speaking, could be a perpetual source of food for your reef aquarium, provided that you continually top it off with a carbon source and uh, more food items. Uh, and also, once you uh, create your concoction for the first time, it's going to take about a day or two before you see a noticeable uh, change in like the consistency and kind of like the viscosity of the water. This is just due to um, the bacteria taking time to replicate and multiply. Uh, once the bacteria reach a limiting capacity within your container, you can kind of notice it because there won't be any changes in color, uh, changes in like the look of the, the water. You'll you'll just know that this is the limiting capacity due to whatever factors are in your specific scenario. It could be the amount of resources that you inputted, uh, the size or the volume of your container, or just some interactions between the bacteria. Um, yeah, and patients, like I said, uh, this can be, you know, if you keep this stuff sterile, I don't see why you couldn't keep a perpetual culture and just continually feed your reef a super, you know, nutritious feed. Also, uh, oxygen, oxygenation and water movement is quite critical. You don't want anything settling uh, for too long in the concoction. Uh, long term, those sediments are just going to harden up, you know, form anoxic zones. Uh, weird gases are going to form, potential bacteria die off. Um, yeah, a lot of, you know, negatives come from stagnant water, as you know. I mean, you don't want to keep your reef stagnant. You obviously don't want to keep the food stagnant. Um, learning to visually observe and notice the changes in your culture is also pretty key. Uh, since a lot of hobbyists don't have the tooling and uh, resources to observe all the characteristics and changes of their concoction. We really have to kind of boil it down to developing this sixth sense that I like to say, um, noticing how the concoction looks, how it smells on certain days, uh, the viscosity of the water, how the water moves throughout, the clumpiness of the particulates. There's a lot of things that you can uh, visually note and learn over time. Uh, you'll just kind of develop this innate sense the more you do it. Um, and then also consistency and testing of your parameters and nutrients. 
um, since you are starting a new method, I always tell people to, you know, start things slowly. And since this is a new venture for you, you don't want to rush in, you know, head first, just do everything kind of rushed and then potentially cause some issues. Like I said, this is a technique best used in heavily like loaded stocked uh, reef systems, just because uh, you're hedging the possibility of creating an unintentional bacteria bloom in your reef. Because since we are dosing uh, pretty much live bacteria, they'll go to work straight away once you put them into your tank. And if your tank is really dirty, um, there's a lot of particulates, uh, organic matter that you're just unaware of, and you dump in a sizable portion of the concoction, the bacteria are going to rapidly go after that food source present in your system. And that could potentially drop your pH or drop the oxygen in your tank. Um, that's why having a lot of corals is kind of like a safeguard because the corals will readily eat the bacteria before you know they can deplete the oxygen. oxygen. And that's kind of like the predator and prey dynamics that I mentioned uh, in the podcast. And, you know, you are what you eat. So depending on what, you know, foods you uh, put into the concoction, the bacteria will have a different nutritional profile, essentially. Bacteria are kind of dependent on the media that they're grown on. And so let's say uh, you included a new food item that has uh, more vitamins or fatty acids or something like that, you'll notice that in the bacteria as well, maybe not visually, but um, downstream effects, you could be noticing better coloration or growth by the introduction of a new ingredient. And uh, that's where, you know, your own experimentation and documentation really is crucial. This is just like essentially creating the stepping stones for future innovation. And yeah, so these are some of the results that you can achieve or what I have uh, personally seen and anecdotally heard from other people trying my method now. Um, one of the results you get is an optimized feeding response and just overall um, vibrance response from your corals. You really notice a change in the health of the coral. The tissue becomes plumper, um, the polyp extension, polyp size and characteristics are drastically changed especially on SPS, um, that look when you turn off all the lights and just look at the system without light, you really notice uh, increased uh, coral tissue health. Like the tissue of an aqua coral pretty much kind of looks like skin at that point, which is really cool. Um, it's really plump, kind of bouncy and not that dehydrated look. Uh, so you can also benefit from increased uh, bioavailability, uh, resource extraction, and nutrient cycling. Um, bioavailability through the better extraction uh, of your foods. So pretty much whatever foods you enter into the concoction, the bacteria will assimilate it, break it down, digest it. And a lot of times those indigestible uh, compounds are digested by the bacteria so you're getting more bang for your buck that way. And then those bacteria readily feed your fish and your corals or, I mean, uh, your inverts, your copepods. And then when they bloom, uh, you know, more downstream effects down the road. And with nutrient cycling, just having a larger uh, bacteria mass just allows you to feed your fish more, add more fish, grow more coral. Uh, and you just, your system is just way better at processing whatever you dump into it. So you can also compete against unwanted organisms as well. Um, with this method, you can pretty much minimize any risk of cyano. Um, I've been doing some experiments or noting some of my own personal experience. When I use this concoction, I pretty much never get cyano blooms. Uh, I recently went off of it for a month just to test my theory. I got cyano again. And uh, within a few days, I've already noticed the cyano uh, dwindling after I resumed uh, the concoction. And this leads me to my next point of improved water quality since the bacteria are pretty much taking out all the waste compounds in the water. You benefit from extreme clarity and um, 
that limits uh, the unwanted organisms and pathogens through that competition, since you're adding a lot of probiotic bacteria that don't really have any negative effects uh, and are readily available as a food source. This seems like a pretty good win-win to me. Um, this also leads to creating a sustainable feed. Um, this is definitely a lot more cheap <laughs> if uh, you want to do it this way. Um, you can definitely get your stuff lasting a lot longer, but I mean, there is uh, somewhat of a costly initial investment. A lot of the products to buy initially might, you know, scare people away, but in the long term, you really don't have to input too much to get a culture going for one and to keep it going. Um, like I said, once you make that initial input of uh, resources, the bacteria will start to replicate and you'll only need to top off the culture once you know certain changes are observed, such as uh, lower bacterial density, uh, changes in odor, stuff like that. And at the end of the day, we get what we wanted. After all, we get increased coral productivity. Your corals just grow faster. It's, it's pretty nuts. Um, that's why... Um, Sunny X uh, is such a huge proponent of the bacteria, and you can really see it in his system where he doesn't really do much beyond uh, just those bacteria and feed his fish. And that's uh, what is one of my original ideas as well. Like, how can we really put that idea on steroids? And uh, just fair warning um, the concoction might be a little stinky. Uh, some people might not uh, like odors. Uh, depending on what food you input into your system, uh, the bacteria are going to have different qualities, as I said. So if you use a you know stinky food like min S, your concoction might uh, smell differently. Or if you were to use something like a powdered food, more like uh, reefroids or benepets. But that's where you know mixing and matching, playing with your own ratio comes into you know this exercise. I'd like to talk about some optimization techniques I've learned uh, in combining everything. We really have to leverage probiotics as it's the backbone of the zeovit and aquaphor systems. What probiotics really do is that they enhance nutrient absorption and provide a lot of uh, side health benefits as well. Um, these bacteria or these beneficial bacteria create a lot of crucial enzymes uh, that break down waste products, proteins, excess carbs, uh, and the like. It also increases the bioavailability of foods. Um, you can see it with a lot of human foods as well. Yogurt, kimchi, sourdough, a lot of fermented foods you can see here. They're all touted as like superfoods or like really good for you. And why are they good for you? They help with your gut health. Why? Your gut, these things allow for better nutrient absorption. You get more bang for your buck from whatever you eat. You're obviously going to feel better, eat less, be healthier, or you know, however you live your life. It's going to improve just through the better nutrient absorption. Another side benefit is that there's an enhanced immune response as well. These good guys compete with the pathogens for resources. They might not directly produce antibiotics or certain antiseptics, but they're certainly going to compete with other guys for the same stuff. And some of them do create antiseptic uh, secretions as well. Like a lot of uh, bacillus have been shown to have anti-vibrio properties. So that's pretty good. If your issue is vibrio, it might work for other uh, bacteria as well. But I think vibrio is chosen as a model organism for that. <clears throat> like I said, bacteria also enhance nutrient cycling. You know. They're at the core, they're at this every step of the way. And they're just constantly cycling. They're constantly cycling, turning dead stuff alive, dead stuff alive, dead stuff alive. And that leads to lower observable nitrate levels, uh, phosphate levels, and overall cleaner water. A lot of people have noted this anecdotally, just dosing bacteria into their system, they note uh, immense water clarity. It's not persistent. But they do notice it. And I think with my method, we can kind of achieve that near persistence. 
bacteria are also uh, quite cost effective as a live feed. They rapidly reproduce, uh, pretty minimal intervention, and they synthesize a lot of bioactive compounds that the corals uh, require, um, certain vitamins, a lot of other things as well, essentially, since some of these bacteria ultimately end up on the coral farm. So I'd like to note that a lot of probiotics are gaining traction as well. Um, people use them in a lot of animal feeds, shrimp, chickens, pigs, fish, and people ultimately take um, probiotics as well. So why not use them for your reef? If they're applied for all these organisms and these benefits are noted. There's even, I mean, it's not even new to reef keeping since KZ in aquifers exists. All right, another optimization technique is the use of prebiotics and uh, carbon dosing. Uh, these things aid the proliferation of beneficial bacteria. And it's crucial when using this method that you have to carbon source because without a carbon source, the bacteria can't reproduce. So if, if you're gonna do this and skip carbon dosing, um, it kind of is counterintuitive. Prebiotics, um, also can have a certain uh, antioxidants within them. And using prebiotics alongside uh, carbon dosing allows for immune modulation, stress relief in animals. And ultimately, since these things, uh, end goal is to promote the beneficial microbes. Also using uh, vitamins, minerals, and additional elemental supplements is another element, uh, optimization technique you read here. Optimal chemistry is the core backbone of everything. I'd like to say that this method that I'm concocting is like the final step that we have to conquer. If you're having issues and you haven't nailed the basics of your water chemistry and your parameters yet, it might be uh, good to look there before you try and meet the nutritional needs. I'm not saying to completely skip over nutrition. It's quite crucial, but if your water is fundamentally screwed, you're not going to be able to grow in corals, even if you're feeding them properly. You know, there's a toxin in the water. You got to get that fixed. But yeah, I mean, a lot of these products are added back in or used. Coral snow acts as a flocculant, has some antimicrobial properties. Trace elements are abundant in this hobby. They all promote optimal biology in their own individual way. So, I mean, one thing does this, one thing does that. Uh, it all does something. And vitamins uh, enhance the nutritional value of things and also increase the productivity of the bacteria as well, since um, the bacteria need vitamins too to do some of their processes. And then another optimization technique is the usage of enzymes to like expedite this whole process. You know, you're putting food, bacteria, uh, trace elements, you're, you're creating a soup, you know, uh, and it's got to get digested. And these enzymes really expedite that process. You know, what an enzyme does is it lowers the activation energy required uh, for a reaction to occur. So you're basically allowing the reaction to occur earlier, faster. Um, so yeah, they act as a catalyst, lower the activation energy. What they do is uh, they enhance the bioavailability of uh, feeds because certain enzymes are used to break down certain uh, compounds like cellulose, there's cellulase, uh, lactase for lactic acid, I believe, or protease for proteins, lipase for lipids, stuff like that. And ultimately, when we combine all these things, what do we get as a result? We get enhanced extraction, improved water quality, and just a cheap live feed that we can continually use. And all this kind of leads into better corals, better, more, better and more corals. Um, you get better quality, water quality because, you know, the water is stripped of like extra excess pollutants and toxins because the bacteria eat that stuff up and then the corals eat it up. If the corals eat it up, they get more energy and, you know, they do it, they live a better life. 
one thing to note is that um, it's a it's key that you keep the concoction oxygenated. Um, you don't want any anoxic zones forming. Uh, so what I do is I use uh, air pump, air stone, or whatever to promote aerobic respiration. I'd also say that this method is best uh, used on heavily stocked systems. Um, it works much better, or I find it more handy because you're, you have more mouths to feed. Not saying you can't use this on a lightly stocked system, but um, it might be too much for what you require. So there's a relatively high investment cost or startup cost, but long run costs are relatively low compared to you know traditional methodology. You're also going to have to frequently monitor and test your parameters and nutrients as well to avoid any uh, potential overdose. I mean. I've been touting a lot of the insane benefits from this method this entire time, but you know, mishaps happen. You can have a heavy hand one day and you are dealing with live feed at the end of the day. These things don't have a mind of their own, but they have a mind of their own in a sense. Um, you can inadvertently cause a bacteria bloom if you add too much into your system and that can lead to rapid oxygen depletion. And if you don't have enough gas exchange, you could essentially suffocate your inhabitants. So that's why I advocate using this method on heavily stocked systems. Why? Because when you have a system packed with corals, those corals are actively siphoning out the, the bacteria. So that uh, deprivation of oxygen is less likely to occur. Still can, odds are less. Thanks everyone for watching the first episode of Critical Reef Theory by CRT. And episode one, we discussed uh, my revolutionary brew, or what I like to call my concoction. And feel free to look at uh, my thread on Reef to Reef, some of my acro collection, and uh, watch out for more content in the future. Also, follow me on Instagram at uh, CRT underscore reefs. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one.